Now, if you wouldn't mind, if you're comfortable, uh, open up your palms, and uh, let's invite the Holy Spirit to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of the faithful. Speak to us this morning. Lord, help us to hear from you. For some of us, Lord, it feels like we never hear from you. And my prayer today uh, for people that are feeling like that right now is that they would hear from you. Maybe in the music, in the prayers, maybe even in my message. But I pray, Lord, that they would hear from you and that they would know that they are beloved children of the Most High God. And that every single one of us here today is a beloved child of the Most High God. Lord, I also ask for my words that you um, use this sinner to be able to speak the truth of your redemption and of your love and of your hope. It's in your name we pray. Amen. There's a, an expression you maybe have heard before, uh, and that expression is, if you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk, right? Uh, you know, if, if you're going to say these things, and you got to be able to actually do them and to live them out. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're continuing our series called The Way, which is based on John Mark Comer's book, uh, Following the Way. Uh, and uh, in three movements in this, in what he's been talking about, first is to be with Jesus. Yeah, we're to be Jesus, uh, if you're to be an apprentice of Jesus, the first step is to be with Jesus. Uh, and hopefully it, it, when you're with Jesus, you start to become like Jesus. And that's what we talked about last week. And if you become like Jesus, what that means is eventually you will do what Jesus did, which is what we're talking about today. So be with Jesus, uh, become like Jesus, and then today do what Jesus Jesus did. And so we're going to look at the scripture that was just read um, a few moments ago. Uh, it comes from 1 John. Now, um, John is, the, uh, uh, is one of Jesus' disciples. And, um, you know, often I talk about Paul, how he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. But here's an interesting fact about John. John is responsible for writing more verses in the New Testament than Paul is. You may not have known that. So next, look for that on Jeopardy next week, maybe. Amen. Uh, and so, you know, John wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote First and Second John. Uh, and then he also wrote the, the book of Revelation. Uh, all those books are considered John. Uh, and, uh, and so John uh, might not have as many books. And there's Third John too. Thank you, Patty, for pointing that out to me. I was seeing if anybody else was paying attention. And, uh, you know, because we're tired. We lost that hour of sleep. And Patty helped me out. So thank you, Patty. Uh, there's 3 John 2. And so even though he doesn't have as many books as Paul, uh, he actually has probably written more verses. Uh, and so we're going to look at a little bit about what he said today. And uh, because I think he hits the nail on the head about what we're talking about. So he starts off uh, verse 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Now that we know, now we know this, um, we have come to know him if we obey his, and the his is Jesus, commandments. Now, what is Jesus' commandment? If you jump back to what John previous wrote in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12, this is what he says about uh, that. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So when we talk about the commandment uh, that uh, John is talking about in 1 John, he's referring back to what is written in the Gospel of John, which is that we are to love, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he continues back to 1 John 2, 4. Whoever says, I've come to know him, but does not obey his commandments is a liar. And in such a person, the truth does not exist. So if you say you know Jesus, so you're with Jesus and you become like Jesus, but you don't actually do what Jesus calls you to do, um, John's you know, got some harsh language here. He's calling you a liar. And then verse 5, but whoever obeys his word, truly in this person, the love of God has reached perfection. What did we talk about last week? Kind of the goal of the Christian life is to live a life of love. By this we will know that we are in him. And then verse 6, whoever says I abide in him, whoever is with Jesus, whoever is becoming like Jesus, ought to walk in the same way as Jesus walked. Ought to walk in the same way as he walked. 
to walk like Jesus walked. So if you want to talk to Jesus talk, what do you need to do? You need to walk like Jesus walked. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just look at a few ways that we might be able to, to walk like Jesus. And maybe some ways you've thought about this before, or maybe you haven't. And John Mark Comer um, in his book actually uh, gave uh, all but one of these that I'm going to use. Uh, and so the first way that we can walk like Jesus walked, and this might not have been something you ever thought about before, is to offer hospitality. Can you guys say offer hospitality? Offer. Yeah, and I love the enthusiasm you guys have today with that, with that less sleep. Offer hospitality. <laughs> I love the way hospitality is defined. It, hospitality is the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. That's what hospitality is. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 19, no, excuse me, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, there's a story about Jesus uh, inviting himself over. Uh, to this tax collector's house named Zacchaeus. One of the things I love about Jesus is that Jesus will invite himself over for a meal. Amen? I think I'm going to start trying that. Uh, I'm just going to show up at somebody's house tonight. Uh, for, I need to find out what you're having first, but then I'll be over. <laughs> Uh, but Zacchaeus uh, was a tax collector, and uh, uh, him and J Jesus saw him, and Jesus said, I'm coming to your house today. And what you need to understand about Zacchaeus is that he was a tax collector, which meant he was um, uh, somebody that was collecting taxes for the occupying government of Israel, which at the time was Rome. And so Zacchaeus was a Jew, and he was seen as a betrayer of the Jewish people. And Jesus wanted to have dinner with him. Which is crazy. Because you would not want to do that. And because Jesus has meal with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus actually becomes an apprentice of Jesus. And he starts to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and then to do what Jesus did. And this story took place around a meal. Meals bring people together, right? Uh, but sometimes meals also keep people apart. Think of the pre-Civil War, pre-Civil Rights restaurants with signs on the door saying whites only. It excluded certain people and welcomed certain people. Even today, think, even today, think of how restaurants are often um, divided by class, right? Some people would not go to a certain restaurant and others of us wouldn't go to another restaurant. Because of, it's like a class system sometimes. Most of us eat with friends or family or people who are like us. And this is true of all cultures, but it was especially true for first century Jewish culture. They called it table fellowship. To eat with someone was a sign of welcome, not just in the one's home, but also in the good standing with the community and even with God. So to eat with tax collectors and sinners was a no-no. Because you were saying that they were okay. And Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, and particularly the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was always eating with the wrong people. Always eating with the wrong people. Jesus ate with the turncoats like Zacchaeus, the prostitutes, the Gentiles, the unclean. Jesus, and because Jesus did this, he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You see, for Jesus, meals were not a boundary marker, but a sign of God's great welcome into the kingdom, not a way to keep people out, but a way to invite people in. In the Gospel of Luke, my favorite gospel, and this is part of the reason why, there are over 50 references to food. Say amen if you can. That's the power of sharing the meal, and that's the power of hospitality. And hospitality is way more than just sharing a meal. But it's providing a welcoming environment where all are welcome. And Jesus excelled in hospitality. As you are aware, I'm pretty sure, um, in the last year and a half, we have really tried to up our hospitality game. Um, simply by having uh, some donuts. Say amen if you can. Uh, donut holes, and great coffee. Now, it's a small token, but we want to try to be hospitable. We want people to feel welcome. 
And when people come to your house, usually you have something for them. Amen? Now, if they catch you by surprise, maybe it's a different story. And I think it's really interesting that it's about the time that we started being more intentional about offering hospitality that we started to experience the growth that we've been experiencing. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think when you're hospitable, people are drawn to you. They want to come. They want to be welcoming. And so one of the first ways that we can become like Jesus, and this is maybe something you haven't thought of before, is practicing hospitality. Inviting people to your house for a meal. If you don't want to cook or don't like to cook or don't want to have to clean the house, then go out to a restaurant, amen? But invite people. That's how relationships are formed. And there's so many lonely people in our world today that when you offer hospitality to someone, it can really be life-changing. Any of us can do this. Invite someone over, invite someone to go out. Be like Jesus and offer hospitality. Here's the second way we can be like Jesus, and this is the bear witness. Uh, Jesus says uh, at the beginning of Acts, before he ascends to the Father, he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. A witness is someone who sees or experiences something important for others to know about. To bear witness, it means to tell others what you saw or experienced. That's it. As followers of Jesus, we are not salesperson, but we are witnesses. To bear witness is to, is to our life with Jesus. And we talked about this back in January, about evangelism being a dirty word, right? And what I want you to think about evangelism is that it's not a dirty word, but it's simply bearing witness to what Jesus has done in your life. If Jesus has done something good for you, don't be bashful. Share it. It's not a sales pitch. You're simply telling what Jesus has done in your life. Think about how Jesus has forgiven you. Think about how Jesus loves you. And to bear witness is simply being able to do that. Another way that we are like Jesus is to live a beautiful life. I love this one, uh, to live a beautiful life. In 1 Peter 2.12, Peter writes, Live such good lives among the, among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. The Greek word translated good here can be translated to beautiful or lovely. Uh, and I think that's just something to think about. One of the best ways that we do what Jesus lived is to live a beautiful life. The people that I've been most attracted to, often it comes from the type of life that they lived. You see them and you see the way they treat people. You see the joy that they have no matter what the circumstances might be. And you see them and you're like, you know, I want to have what they have. That's a beautiful life. And it's pretty cool that Jesus invites us to live a beautiful life. And when we live that life, people see that life and they are attracted to it. Dr. Uh, Michael Green of Oxford wrote a book called Evangelism in the Early Church. And he, in his book, he argues that the spread of the Christian faith was mostly the result of Christians living in such a way that people were drawn to the beauty of their lives. It wasn't their words. It wasn't what they it was just who they were and how they lived their lives and people were attracted to it and they saw that and they said, you know what? I want what they have. And so they lived their life in a good and beautiful way. Are you living that kind of life? A good and beautiful life. That's the power our lives can have. And then the last way I have for us today, uh, how we can um, do what Jesus did, is to extend grace. If there's one thing that's lacking in our world today, it's grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And it's the, uh, pretty much what I would say, it's kind of like God loves us, even maybe when God shouldn't love uh, loves us. He extends that grace to us, even when we don't deserve it. 
We love to receive grace, but we don't love to give grace. Amen? You know, the story I like to tell is, imagine you're on 288, and you're going 85 miles an hour. Not that any of y'all would do that, right? And you pass a cop. And yes, you pass that cop. He sees you. What do you start saying after you pass the cop? Grace, 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 right? Imagine you're on 288 and you're actually going about the speed limit this time and somebody passes you going 85 miles an hour. What do you want for that person? Justice, 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 justice. We want grace, but we often don't like to extend grace to others. And perhaps the primary way that we do what Jesus did is by being people that extend grace. And I just love how Jesus' life illustrates this for us again and again. You know, we just talked about the tax collector Zacchaeus. Again, he was a betrayer of his country. And yet Jesus invited himself to have dinner with him. Jesus wanted to have table fellowship with this guy who was seen as scum of the earth. He extended grace to him. I think about Peter, uh, the apostle Peter. You know, he um, uh, loved Jesus, and he said, Jesus, I will never betray you. And as we know, if we know the story, we know that he betrays Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. The next time Jesus sees him, what's he do? He welcomes him back. He extends that grace to him. I think about probably the best example. Jesus is on the cross. And as he's dying, literally taking his last breath, he sees his disciples who have abandoned him in his time of need. He sees the religious leaders who are partly responsible for getting him on the cross. He sees the the, uh, civil leaders that are also responsible for him being on the cross. And as he's dying, as he's taking his last breath, he looks at them and he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. He extends grace. Again and again and again and again. Jesus extends grace. And in the same way that Jesus extends that grace, if we want to walk like Jesus walked, we are also called to extend that grace. Our world is in desperate need of grace. Think what would happen in our family. Think what would happen in our community. Think what would happen at our workplace. Think what would happen in our church if we simply became people that extended grace. Everything would be transformed. And so that's my challenge to you guys. Is to do what Jesus did. And so here are some next steps. They're not very creative this week. I apologize for that. Do what, so next step, do what Jesus did. Offer hospitality. How can you extend hospitality? Who is somebody you know that's maybe down and out? Maybe they made some big mistakes. Maybe they've even wronged you. And you just maybe need to share a meal with them. Who is somebody that It would do you good just to extend hospitality to. Bear witness. Let your life speak. Don't you don't you're not trying to be a salesperson. You're simply trying to share what God is doing in your life. Third, live a beautiful life. When we begin to live a beautiful life, when we become content with what we have instead of what we don't have, always wanting more, always wanting something else, always wanting something new, always wanting something different, and we become content with who we are, and we begin to live that beautiful life that radiates, and people see that, and they say, you know what, something's different about them, and I want what they have. And then lastly, extend grace. In the same way that Jesus extends grace to us and mercy and forgiveness, may we extend that grace to others, that amazing grace. Amen? Let's pray. 
Most gracious, loving Lord, we thank you so much for loving us. And Lord, help us to walk the walk. As we are with you, Lord, hopefully we become like you. And as we become like you, we begin to actually do what you did. Help us to model our, life after, our lives after you. And help us to be people that extend grace. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.